Hi. Today's lecture is going to cover section 3.2 in the LOCKED 5 textbook, and this section is on confidence intervals. This will be the first topic that we'll be covering that involves statistical inference, which, as we've mentioned before, is the way in which we're going to use our sample to talk about our population. So confidence intervals will be our first way to come up with an idea of what our population parameter might be using um, statistical inference. So the key concepts in this section are uh, margin of error, confidence intervals, and confidence level, and then how do we actually interpret and misinterpret confidence intervals. So this table is very similar to the table that I had last time. Um, whenever we're doing anything in statistics, whenever we're working on a problem, the first thing we need to do is identify the parameter of interest. And for this entire course until we get to the very end, these are going to be the five different parameters of interest. These are going to be the five parameters that we're going to estimate in our samples that we're going to want to use to talk about our population parameters. And so whenever you're reading a passage, um, a little word problem, try to determine which one of these parameters is the one that you're actually interested in. And so this is just a recap of what we had before with a little less information, so I won't go into the details. So statistical inference, as a, as a reminder, is essentially using a sample statistic, such as a proportion or a mean, to estimate a population parameter, which would also be a proportion or a mean. So we would use the sample proportion to estimate the population proportion. We would use the sample mean to estimate the population mean. Our sample statistic represents the best estimate of the population parameter, and I also said that it recommends what I'm calling a point estimate. Sample statistics can vary from sample to sample. We've talked about the fact that if, if I were to take a random sample of students at St. Mike, measure their height, uh, and calculate the average height, and then I did the same thing again, uh, maybe involving some of those students, but most likely involving other students, that those two sample means would not be the same, even though both of them represent a, an estimate for the average height of students at St. Mike's. And this is because sample statistics vary. They vary from sample to sample. If statistics didn't vary from sample to sample, we wouldn't have to do statistics. Everything would be gravy. It would be super easy. So because of the fact that statistics vary from sample to sample, what we would like to do is come up with a range of plausible values. Right now we have a point estimate, we have a, our best estimate, a single estimate, but we'd like to come up with a range of plausible values for the population parameter. And essentially what this is going to involve is calculating something called a margin of error and using this to construct this interval, this interval which will give us a range of plausible values. So let's look at an example. So this is an example on climate change. It was a survey that was conducted um, last September um, by CBS News, and they asked a nationally representative sample of 2,413 U.S. residents. They asked them this question. Today, do you consider the issue of climate change to, to be a crisis, a serious problem, a minor problem, or not a problem? 64% said that it was a crisis or a serious problem. The survey reported a margin of error of 2.2 percentage points. What we would like to do is find slash calculate an interval that gives a range of plausible values for the proportion of all Americans that believe that climate change is a crisis or a serious problem, right? So our population is all Americans. We have a sample on 2,143 Americans. We'd like to be able to use those Americans to be able to talk about all Americans. We have an estimate of 64% of those people that, were, that responded that it was a crisis or a serious problem with a margin of error of 2.2. So how do we use this information? Well, to use a margin of error, we basically take it and add it from the sample statistic. And this will give us a range of plausible values for the population parameter. So it's this simple formula where you have your sample statistic plus or minus the margin of error. And now you have a range of plausible values for your population parameter. So the margin of error is a number that reflects the precision of the sample statistic as an estimate for this parameter. Precision is sort of the flip side of variability or variation. So the more precise something is, the less variable it is. 
So it's kind of this inverse relationship. So as variability increases, precision decreases. As variability decreases, precision increases. And the margin of error is our way to, to essentially understand and quantify that precision. So this is a very straightforward and simple formula to use. So let's see how we use it. So before we said that 64% said that climate change was a crisis or serious problem, and the survey reported a margin of error of 2.2 percentage points. So to use the margin of error to calculate a range of plausible values, we're going to take our sample statistic, and we're going to add and subtract our margin of error, which I'm going to represent as MOE. Now, our sample statistic here says 64%. Now, hopefully, whenever you see a percent, you think, okay, this is going to be a proportion. So we're going to convert that into a proportion. So our proportion is 0.64. So that's 64% as a proportion. And this is going to be an estimate for P, which is our population proportion, which is the proportion of all Americans. Now, we know what our margin of error is. It's 2.2% percent percentage points. But just like with our proportion, we need to convert that to a, um, to a proportion. We need to put it on the right scale. So that essentially involves getting rid of the decimal place and turning it over to 0 0.022. So if you were to take that value, multiply it by 100, you're going to get a percent. Now we're ready to go. We have everything we need. So it becomes p hat plus or minus our margin of error. And it becomes 0.64 plus or minus 0 0.022. And that answer is 0 0.62 to 0.66. So a range of plausible values for the proportion of all Americans who believe that climate change is a crisis or a serious problem is 62.62 to 0.66, or roughly 62% to 66% of all Americans believe that climate change is a crisis or a serious problem. We'll look at one more example, and this example before we, before we change topics. Um, and this, this example looks at the upcoming election. As I'm sure everybody's aware, there's an upcoming election in November, and it's Joe Biden, the Democratic candidate against Donald Trump, the Republican incumbent. And so a recent poll by Emerson poll found that the proportion of likely voters and likely voters are people that have been asked, do you plan to vote, that would vote for Donald Trump over Joe Biden in the upcoming election was 0.44. So 44% or as a proportion, 0.44. The proportion of votes that President Trump received in 2016 was 0.461. Assume that Trump only needs 0.461 or more to win re-election. How likely would he be to win re-election based on two possible margins of error? First, a margin of error of 0 0.005 or a margin of error of 0 0.03. So as a reminder, our, to calculate this range of plausible values, it's going to be sample stat plus or minus our MOE. Our sample stat is our P hat. And P hat is what we're interested in is 0.44. And our margin of error is going to be, um, it depends on the scenario. So in the very first scenario, our margin of error is 0 0.005. So that's going to be 0.44 plus or minus 0 0.005. And just because I skipped this before, I want to expand, expand this just so that you understand what this means. This means 0 0.44 minus 0 0.005 and 0 0.44 plus 0 0.005. And that's going to equal 0.435 to 0.445. So if that was our margin of error, and we want to see would Donald Trump win re-election, well, we see that 0.461 is not in that margin of error. So based on this margin of error, he would not win. So let's look at the actual margin of error of the survey. So that was 0 0.003. So that's 0.44 plus or minus 0 0.003. Oops, just one, uh, just one zero there. <clears throat> and it's going to be 0 0.44 um, minus 0 0.03, and then 0 0.44 plus 0 0.03. So this is going to be 0 0.41 plus 0 0.03, and 
2.47. So based on this scenario, because 4.61 is inside this range, that means it is possible that Donald Trump could win re-election. So given our true margin of error, the one that was actually used in the survey, it is possible that if Donald Trump only needed 47% of the vote to win, that he could win re-election. However, this is, this is an important caveat because we don't know what proportion of the vote a president will need to win this upcoming election. And as you're probably well aware, in this country, the popular vote is not what determines the presidency, but instead it is electoral college. So what is this range of plausible values stuff that we've been talking about? Well, the range of plausible values is the confidence interval. It's just another way to refer to it. So a confidence interval for a parameter is an interval computed from sample data by a method that will capture the data for a specified proportion of all samples. So it's basically going to be a statistical technique that will allow us to capture our population par parameter based on some value that we want it to be able to capture it. So like X percent of the time. And that X percent of the time is what's referred to as the confidence level. So <clears throat> to be more concrete, if we were to say construct a 95% confidence interval, we would expect that 95% of the confidence intervals from all of the samples, for all the samples, would contain the population parameter. Now this is kind of a clunky interpretation um, because it's like, wait a minute, we only ever have one sample. We don't have all the samples. But if you imagine that you were able to uh, get all of the samples for a given sample size, and you were to uh, create this confidence interval, this confidence interval would uh, capture the population parameter 95% of the time. And that's what we mean when we say 95% confidence interval. So it's kind of a clunky interpretation, but I will show you um, in an activity and then a little bit later in the slides um, what this kind of means. So when you're thinking about this, okay, the 95% confidence interval, how does this work? Um, and why 95%? If you remember, we talked about this 95% rule. So when your data look roughly bell-shaped and symmetric, what we know is that if you're at your sample mean and you go down two standard deviations and you go up two standard deviations, this area in the middle is approximately 95% of your data. Right? So if we were to go, if we were to take the sample mean and then we were going to subtract two standard errors, I mean standard deviations, excuse me, and then we were to take the sample mean and add two standard errors, uh, I don't mean standard errors, I mean standard deviations, this would allow us to capture 95% of the data, which we could also shorthand like this. So hopefully you're like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe this is how we can get the margin of error. Really, we know what the sample mean would be. We know what two would be, but we're, no, we're not gonna use this, the st sample standard deviation. Instead, we're gonna use something uh, that we've talked about called the standard error. And if you remember right, the standard error is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So the sampling distribution is a distribution for a given sample statistic, such as a sample mean, and the standard error is going to be the standard deviation of all those sample means for a given sample size. Um, and in the situation where our sampling distribution, not the raw data, this was just used to illustrate the 95% rule, is relatively symmetric and bell-shaped, a 95% confidence interval can be estimated using this formula, the sample statistic plus or minus two times the standard error. Now this part over here is really what we've been calling the margin of error. And so the margin of error is always going to be that part that you add or subtract from the sample statistic. And it doesn't necessarily have to always equal two times standard error. It just does here because this is for a 95% confidence interval. So let's see this in action. So in this example, we've got CEO compensation. So beginning in 2017, public companies were required to disclose the ratio of the CEO pay to the median worker pay. The glass, 
Door Economic Research Blog, published the data for 2014. A random sample of 25 CEOs were taken. For this sample, the sample size equals 25, the sample mean was 199.6, and the sample standard deviation was 146.35. The standard error for means, based on samples of size n equals 25 from this population, was estimated to be 25.23. What is the best estimate for the ratio of the CEO pay to the median worker pay, and what is the margin of error? Okay. What is the best estimate for the ratio of CEO pay to median worker pay? If you see the word best pay, you're looking for a sample statistic. Um, and in this case, we've got a sample mean, we've got a sample standard deviation, and we've got a sample standard error. Well, if we're trying to find our best estimate for the ratio of the CEO pay to the median worker pay, we know that has to be the sample mean. So that's going to be x bar equals 199.6. And then what is the margin of error? So I told you the margin of error is going to equal 2 times the standard error, right? Because that in that formula before, so it's going to be 2 times 29.27. And that value is going to be roughly 60. So it's probably more like... Um, uh, 59.5, but we'll say it's approximately 50, uh, 60. <clears throat> now, one thing you've probably noticed is the standard deviation was 146.35 and the standard error of 29.27. These are quite different. Well, how can this be the case? I hope that you look at this and you're like, well, the standard deviation is a measure of the variability around the sample mean. So it says how variable we would expect people to be in the ratio of the CEO pay to the median worker pay around the mean. The standard error, however, is not about the sample. It's about the sampling distribution. So this is telling us uh, about our standard deviation in our sampling distribution. So there is no reason for these to actually be the same at all. And in fact, they, they will vary almost always they won't be the same and almost always the standard error will be less. So remember standard error, sampling distribution, a standard deviation will just be for the sample. Continuing with this, the next thing we're asked to do is to find the 95% confidence interval for the average ratio of CEO pay to median worker pay based on the information above. So if we were to do that, we're going to take x bar plus or minus 2 times the standard error. It's going to equal 199.6 plus or minus 2 times 229.27, which we can expand out to 199.6 minus um, approximately 60, and then 199.6 plus approximately 60. And if you don't round and you actually do the math out, you should end up getting 141.06 and 258.14. This is our range of plausible values. This is our 95% confidence interval. So in this particular data, we know that the true population parameter mu is equal 27.91. Did our confidence interval that we generated from this one sample this is our confidence interval right here. Does that contain the true parameter value? So we're looking in this in this uh, interval right here, is 207.91 in there? The answer is yes. It's the same thing we did when we were looking to see if 0.461 was in that ratio, I mean, was in that interval for Donald Trump's um, uh, proportion of votes he would receive. So for this slide here, it's more of the same kind of a thing that we just did before. It's more practice just learning how to calculate confidence intervals. And the only thing I would point out is here the true population proportion is written down here, and it says that it's p equals 0 0.50. Now, I will not go over this example here, but I will tell you right now that this example will appear on our... Um, our readiness quiz. So take a look at this and make sure you understand how to calculate this.
but it's exactly like the previous problems. You have a sample statistic and you have a standard error, and then you just need to put that piece, those pieces together and calculate your 95% confidence interval. The one thing I will note is that what we see here to, to the right here is that I'm essentially showing you that, uh, that in this situation, that the sampling distribution is approximately bell-shaped and symmetric. And I say it's flipping a coin because in the situation where our population proportion is equal to 0.5, that's analogous to flipping a coin. Because if you have a coin and it has a heads and it has a tails, you'd expect that 50% of the time the heads would come up and 50% of the time the tails would come up. So that's akin to just flipping a coin. And as you learned on uh, Tuesday, we can use coins um, in this class to do simulations and to simulate a sampling distribution. And that's what we see right here. So if we were to dig into that sampling distribution a little bit more, because right here is our proportion, our true proportion is 0.5. What we see here are confidence intervals. So each one of these horizontal lines corresponds to a confidence interval. The dot in the middle corresponds to our best estimate, which is the sample proportion. Now, if one of these lines overlaps with the, uh, with the true population proportion, then I have coded them as the color blue. If they don't, they are orange. So this is just the first 100 of the simulations that's shown in this uh, dot plot right here. So if we were to count up the number of uh, intervals that don't overlap with the true population proportion, then we would expect that number to be, out of 100, to be about 5. So let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6. So that's actually, 6 is really close to 5. And you see how a confidence interval doesn't always have to contain the true population proportion. And in fact, if we had done this more than 100 times, but say 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 times, we would expect that 95% of those random samples, their confidence intervals would contain the true population proportion. And in this situation where we're just looking at the first 100, we see that actually six of them uh, don't include it, which means 94 do. 94 is awfully close to 95. So now we're going to get to interpreting confidence intervals. And I would say interpreting confidence intervals is probably the most important part of uh, this lesson because you're going to, hopefully you can understand why confidence intervals are work and how we derive that, like why this makes sense from this kind of a visualization. Um, but the most important piece is going to be, can, I, can you actually put it into words? Do you know what it means? So we don't, we usually only have a single mean sample and we have no idea what the population proportion, uh, population parameter really is. And we don't know if our CI actually contains the true population proportion. And CI is my shorthand for confidence interval, right? So back here in this simulation where I'm flipping a coin, I could tell how many times the coin, um, the confidence interval uh, overlapped with 0.5. But I don't know that because I usually don't know the population proportion, uh, population parameter. And so we don't know if it actually contains the true population parameter. So what we don't know then, are we an interval that contains it or are we an interval that doesn't? So this comes up to how we interpret confidence level and ultimately how we're going to interpret a confidence interval. So the confidence level indicates how sure we are that our interval contains a population parameter. So we interpret a 95% confidence interval by saying we are 95% sure or 95% confident that the interval contains the population parameter. And we should also say we are 95% sure, we are 95% confident that the interval contains the population parameter, specify what that population parameter is, and then say what the values are that it's between. So it's this lower value and this upper value. And we'll do this with an example. The National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey is a program of studies designed to assess the health and, and nutritional status of adults and children in the United States. The survey is unique in that it combines intervals and physical examinations. Data on total cholesterol, pulse rate, HDL, 
and LDL, which are two different forms of cholesterol, were collected on 2,623 participants. The sample mean total for those surveyed was 188.86 with a standard error of 0.82. First thing we want to do is we want to calculate and interpret this interval. So we're going to assume, because we don't have any reason at this point, um, not assume this, and because I've told you that lots of our statistics are really well behaved in this course, that we can use the sample stat plus or minus 2 times the standard error to calculate this. Well, we have all the information we need here. X bar is our sample stat, and our standard error is 0.82. So it's X bar plus or minus 2 times the standard error. This equals 188.86 plus or minus 2 times 0.82, which equals, pull it up here really quick, that equals 187.22 to 190.50. Those are the numbers. So how do we interpret it? We say, let me make this just a little bit thinner for writing here, because it's a little it's a little verbose. We are 95% sure, or you could say confident, that the average total cholesterol for all adults living in the U.S. is between 187.22 and 190.50. That is our interpretation. We are 95% sure that the average total cholesterol for all adults living in the U.S. is between 187.22 and 190.50. So our next question asks us, it says, a total cholesterol level greater than or equal to 200 is classified as high. Is it plausible that America's overall average total cholesterol would be classified as high? Well... What we want to do here is we want to say, is 200 in this interval? 200 is not in that interval. Therefore, the answer is no. No, because 200 is not in our 95% confidence interval. Now, a value of 188 or 189 those are plausible values. Remember, a, a confidence interval is a range of plausible values. So if a value is not in that uh, confidence interval, it is not a plausible value. We'll look at one more example. And I would encourage you um, in your textbook, there are some really good examples um, for doing confidence intervals. And this is these are examples 3.16 through 3.19. And I think they're really good examples, and they're similar to, to these ones here. I've, I've sort of adapted and put my own context around these problems, but I would encourage you to take a look at them if, you're, if you um, want some more, uh, you want to get a deeper understanding of these. And I mean 3.18, not 3.19. Um, so in this one, the sample difference in mean LDL between men and women was calculated to be 0.0386 with a standard error of 1.41. So note this is men minus women. LDL is the unhealthy cholesterol. You really want to have a low LDL. It's, it's not good to have a high LDL. That's the bad one. So what we're asked to do is to give and interpret a 95% confidence interval. So let's do this. So we need to calculate it. So it's going to be our sample statistic plus or minus two times our standard error. Our sample statistic is X bar M minus x bar w, plus or minus 2 times our standard error. And remember that x bar m minus x bar w is an estimate of mu m minus mu w. So this value for our sample statistic is 0 0.0389, plus or minus 2 times our standard error, 
1.41. That's going to equal negative 2.781 to 2.8. Six, uh, five, uh, five, nine. So now we need to interpret it. So we can interpret it like this. We are 95%, um, this time I'm going to say confident, confident that men's LDL is between negative 2.781 in 2.859 points higher than women's. And I should insert in here, this should be men's, let me, let me just make this just a little bit, men's average LDL is between Point negative two seven eight one and two point eight five nine points higher than women's average LDL, and this is going to be for all men and for all women. So it's important that this that you understand that. Now this interpretation looks a little bit different just because it's a difference, and so I'm interpreting the difference, the difference in the direction. So here we see that we're looking, we're doing men minus women, which is why I say men minus women. Another alternative interpretation for this, which doesn't specify this directionality, is just to say we are 95% confident that the difference in mean LDL between all men and women in the US adult population is between negative 2.781 and 2.859. So these are both um, interpretations that are, are correct. Hopefully you can understand that. I'll read this a little bit one more time just in case my, my handwriting is difficult to read. We are 95% confident that the difference in mean LDL between all men and women in the U.S. adult population is between negative 2.781 and 2.859. So that's one interpretation. The other one, the first one I gave was, we are 95% confident that, that the average LDL, and this should be for all men. Um, let me actually rewrite that, just because I think I can write it better. We are 95% confident that the Average LDL for all men is between negative 2.781 and 2.859 points higher than the average, oops, the, than the average LDL for all women in the U.S., adult pop. So I just, the reason I just rewrote this is that I wanted to make it clear to you that I'm talking about all men and women. I'm talking about their average. And you'll notice the first time I did this, I omitted the word average. And then the second time I did it, I didn't mention all. And so it's important that you mention both what the actual parameter is, which is the mean, the mean difference, and that you mentioned that you're talking about everybody, your entire population. So our question, and this one I like, I will ask questions like this all the time. Is it plausible that there's no difference in the average LDL between men and women? So if the average, if the average LDL between men and women, there was no difference, what would that look like numerically? What is no difference? That would be, does mu1... I mean, mu m minus mu w, does that equal zero? Because that's equivalent to saying, does mu m equal mu w, which is no difference, right? These are mathematically equivalent. Uh, to move from the, the top line to the second line, you just add mu w to the other side. So what we're looking for is zero. 
is zero in this interval? Is zero in the interval? The answer is no. Zero is not in the, I mean, sorry, the answer is yes. You're like, yes, Chris, the answer, the answer is correct. Uh, yes, the zero is in there. Yes, zero is in here, so it is plausible. There is no difference in average LDL. So because zero is in the interval, that means that there is no difference. And this is a form of statistical testing. This is inference. So you've now done, essentially, when we're doing all of this stuff, you're doing your first statistical testing. And that's what confidence intervals are. Now we're going to end with a couple misinterpretations of confidence intervals. And we're going to try to um, help you understand why they're not correct. I would also encourage you to take a look in your textbook. And one of the problems we're going to work on for the homework is going to help you correct misinterpretations of confidence intervals. So the first misinterpretation is that a confidence interval, a 95% confidence interval, contains 95% of the data in the population. A 95% confidence interval contains 95% of the data in the population. Well, that's not true, right? Because a confidence interval is actually talking about a parameter, right? It's not talking about data. The data is, is something different. In the population, the data are the cases and the units. But what we're capturing with a 95% confidence interval is that we hope to capture the population parameter 95% of the time. So this one doesn't make any sense. So a 95% confidence interval contains 95% of the data. No, it doesn't. A 95% confidence interval is constructed such that 95% of the time it should contain the population parameter. The next misconception is, I am 95% sure that the mean of a sample will fall within a 95% interval for the mean. I would encourage you to be 100% sure. And here's why. So if we're trying to calculate a confidence interval for the mean, we have our sample stat plus or minus our two times the standard error. So we do x bar plus or minus two standard errors. And if we expand that, it's x bar minus two standard errors and x bar plus two standard errors. What number is exactly in the middle of that interval? X bar, which is our sample mean. So the sample mean is always in the 95% confidence interval. So this one doesn't make any sense. You can be 100% sure that the mean of a sample will fall within a 95% confidence interval for the mean. If you calculate a 95% confidence interval and it doesn't contain the sample mean, you've done something wrong. The final one says, I am 95% sure that the population mean will fall within a 95% confidence interval for the mean. So this one's a little confusing. So you can't really think about it like that because really what, what, what is the case is that the population mean is either in the interval or it's not in the interval. So in sort of thinking about it in kind of this probabilistic kind of way, being like I'm 95% sure that it will fall in there, well, that's actually not correct because the population mean is in it or it isn't in it. Think back to that plot where I drew where they looked like there were these lines that looked like this, right? In that situation, the population mean was either in it or it wasn't in it. It's not that we're 95% sure that the population mean will fall within a 95% confidence interval. We're 95% confident that essentially of all of the 95% confidence intervals we could calculate based on all of the samples we could take, for a given sample size, that they would contain the population mean, which is a different thing. So be careful about these. The one I would make would, uh, would mention the most is that these first two are the ones that you're going to struggle with for interpretation. Um, in my experience, students have a really hard time understanding that a confidence interval does not contain 95% of the data in the population, and they want to always say they're 95% sure that the sample mean will be in the 95% confidence interval. These are not correct, so I would encourage you to try to understand why these are not correct and to, if nothing else, fossilize that they're not correct. A 95% confidence interval contains the, the true population parameter 95% of the time, so you can be 95% sure that the population parameter is within the confidence interval. 
Okay, so we're going to work on an activity today that I will that I hope will help to clear up some of these misinterpretations, um, as well as give you some clearer idea of how confidence intervals work. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email or to ask in class or to set up a time to video with me. I hope everybody's having a great day.